Halo Combat Evolved is one of the best and most influential first person shooters ever created. I couldn't stop playing it back in 2001 and all these years later I haven't been able to stop writing about it either. This video is a supercut of much of that work, a detailed level by level analysis of Halo's campaign from beginning to end. I do hope you enjoy it and without further ado let's begin with the Pillar of Autumn. The Pillar of Autumn begins with a view of the titular Halo itself, which I think you'll agree is rather appropriate given the name of the game, before the camera pans up to the enormous human ship the level is named after, where the first ever mission in the series takes place. Something Bungie really focuses on for the duration of the level is building up the Covenant as an extremely threatening enemy, and this begins right off the bat through the dialogue between Cortana and Keys. So, where do we stand? Our fighters are mopping up the last of their recon picket now, nothing serious. But I've isolated approach signatures for multiple CCS class battle groups, making three capital ships per group. And in about 90 seconds, they'll be all over us. Well, that's it then. Bring the ship back up to combat alert Alpha. I want everyone at their station. Everyone, sir? Everyone. And in general, I think this short cinematic does an excellent job of setting the scene while avoiding any long bouts of exposition, something you'll see Bungie avoid throughout Combat Evolve's campaign. You know there's a mysterious ring world floating in space nearby, you know that the Pillar of Autumn and the humans on board it are isolated from the rest of humanity, and you know that the Covenant are about to attack the ship, and that's about all you really need to know before you get cracking. There's a nice touch shortly after involving Johnson's speech, which will change depending on whether you're playing on easy or normal, or on heroic or legendary. This change is of no real consequence, but considering Halo both begins and ends on the Pillar of Autumn, featuring a scene in both involving Johnson that changes depending on what difficulty you've selected is a nice touch which helps further align the two missions. After Johnson's speech, it's time for the Master Chief himself to be thawed out so that you can get used to the game's most basic mechanics, namely movement, aiming, health and shields. The way they are introduced is definitely worth noting. Rather than being explained to the player unimaginatively through a list of long text boxes or similar, although it is worth noting that that does still happen a little more than I'd like, everything is explained entirely in world. Using the right stick to look around is necessary so that a calibration reading can be taken from your battlesuit's diagnostics, and your health meter appears when your systems are bought online. You're then encouraged to get used to movement using the left stick by taking a walk around the diagnostic bay, an optical diagnostic station is used to ensure your controls are configured correctly, and you finally head to the energy shield test station which shows you exactly how the recharging shield mechanic works. This last test was particularly important at the time, as recharging health mechanics were not the mainstay of first person shooters that they are these days. Indeed it was Halo which popularised the concept to begin with, but it should also be noted that the brief movement and aiming tasks were fairly important too. Halo was by no means the first game to put movement on the left stick and aiming on the right, but it was still something very new, and the FPS genre at the time, at least on consoles, wasn't the juggernaut it is in the present, so a huge percentage of players would likely never have experienced such a control system before. By including these quick and easy tests straight off the bat, Bungie ensured that every single player had a working knowledge of the controls they'd need to succeed, and introduced them in a way that they became part of the story and didn't slow down proceedings too much. It may not be that exciting now practically every modern video game uses a similar introduction, but at the time it was still a very novel feature. Moments after getting to grips with everything you catch your first glimpse of the Covenant. Bridge to Cryo 2, this is Captain Key. Send the Master Chief to the bridge immediately. Captain, we'll have to skip the weapons diagnostics and On I- the double, crewman. Aye, aye, sir. The skipper seems jumpy. We'd better get moving. We'll find you weapons later. Okay, I'll leave the self-diagnostics running at least. Oh God, they're trying to get through the door! Security! Intruders in Cryo 2! Please don't! Sam! Sam! Come on, we've got to get the hell out of here! after which you have to jump over a pipe to progress, forcing you to utilise another part of Halo's movement, similar to later in the mission where you have to crouch to move under a set of blast doors. During the next few sections, you're forced to move through the Autumn unarmed while evading groups of Covenant. I mentioned earlier that Bungie is keen for you to see them as a threat from Combat Evolve's outset, and I think this section is an important part of doing that. You often only catch glimpses of them in the shadows, which definitely helps them seem more threatening, and even though it's practically impossible to actually be killed during this segment, the various NPCs which do bite the dust do a good job of highlighting just how much of a threat your new enemy poses to regular humans. Of course, you are no 
normal human, and small covenant squads like the one you run into will soon pose no problem, but putting you on the back foot even for just a few moments is a wise decision by Bungie as it helps you build a healthy amount of respect for the covenant before you later begin shooting your way through wave after wave of them. Reaching the bridge, Captain Key's Taskmaster Chief with escorting Cortana off the Autumn and stopping her from falling into the Covenant's hands at all costs. Which is where you come in, Chief. Get Cortana off this ship. Keep her safe from the enemy. If they capture her, they'll learn everything. Force deployment, weapons research, Earth. I understand. At which point you're finally given a weapon and it's time to get shooting. You don't have to just shoot the Covenant either. You can also immediately go rogue and become the enemy of humankind. What the hell are you doing? Security to the bridge. The Master Chief has gone rampant. Take him down, boys. And I like that Bungie accounted for this, even if it is only a small addition. As you might expect, your first proper encounter with the Covenant is a relatively easy one as you take on a trio of grunts before things get a little trickier. Choosing the mess hall as the setting for your second encounter was without doubt a deliberate one on Bungie's part. Firstly, because it gives you time to fight your first elites from a distance so you don't get too overwhelmed early on, and second, because it helps continue to create something of a difficulty curve as you move from encounter to encounter. You've already fought a pack of grunts, a simple opening challenge, and now you're fighting grunts and elites in a large area while being backed up by marines, a slightly tougher challenge. Immediately after you'll take on the same enemies again but in close quarters, which is what you'll then do for a little while, before taking on the mission's final challenge, which is doing the same but with some verticality thrown in as well. Continuing your escape, you get a chance to melee an elite from behind, which demonstrates how powerful the attack can be and also reminds you that it's something you can actually do, although there will be another opportunity to do this later on where the game prompts you to do so just in case you didn't get the hint the first time. And that is swiftly followed by this. Get up so I can kill you again! What the hell? Did something just hit us? Move in! Back to the airlock! The Pillar of Autumn does an impressive job of making it feel like you are under attack and that events are constantly changing, and it seems like this, the amount of NPCs which get involved, and the various other changes to the environment which really help drive that home. Another facet of the mission's design which causes a more delayed impact is its narrowness. In other parts of Halo, narrow areas tend to be preceded by or follow much wider spaces, and this helps the game flow much better and feel less repetitive. The Pillar of Autumn, on the other hand, is the only mission in the campaign which doesn't really feature any open spaces at all, which makes sense from a design perspective as it means you're better able to focus on getting used to the core mechanics without being too distracted. Whether it was intentional or not, what this also ends up doing is making subsequent missions, and especially Halo, the campaign's second mission, feel much more impressive. To begin with, Combat Evolves seems like it may not be much more than a narrow sci-fi shooter, and as such, the transition to far larger spaces as soon as the first mission ends is absolutely felt more acutely as a result. Eventually you'll make your way upstairs through the area I mentioned earlier and witness a number of lifeboats leaving the Autumn, which you watch from a window you have to directly approach to ensure you don't miss yet another example of the Covenant's brutality. The life pods are launching. We should hurry. Covenant are destroying the life pods. They really don't want us on that ring. The way Bungie guides you to the window is fairly elementary game design, but I think it's worth highlighting nonetheless, as these little touches definitely all add up over the course of the game. As you reach the mission's final third, you might think there's not too much left to learn, but there's still a few new things to get to grips with before the mission concludes. First up are nav points and the flashlight. Warning, blast door's closing. We have to use the ship's maintenance access ways. Follow the nav point, it will lead you to an opening. Which are quickly followed by the motion tracker. I'm detecting Covenant movement outside the access ways. Activating motion tracker. Let's find a safe exit. They're right on top of us. Let's find another way through. In all honesty, I've always thought these sections in the maintenance tunnels slowed down the pace of things a little bit too much for my liking. Everything up until this point is frankly exhilarating, but given that it shows you how nav points work, demonstrates the usefulness of the flashlight, and allows you to observe how the motion tracker functions from a safe area, I suppose they serve enough of a purpose that you could argue that their inclusion is justified. 
thankfully, once you're out of the vents, things begin to pick up again, starting with the even more obvious melee opportunity I mentioned earlier. You bash a door open first, so Bungie can ensure you've used the action at least once prior, and then you encounter a lone grunt conveniently standing with his back to you. You do also get another massive and, in my view, unnecessary pop-up tutorial, which I again really don't think needed to be used considering how good a job the mission generally does of introducing you to new concepts organically, although playing Devil's Advocate, like the Vents, you could argue that this inclusion is here for a good reason. When people talk about Halo being a revolutionary title, one of the things they will often highlight is the game's controls, and quite rightly so. Some inclusions that made them so fantastic, for example the dual stick setup and subtle aim assist, had been used by other games prior, but far less, if any, had included both dedicated grenade and melee buttons. And with that being the case, the concept of being able to whack an enemy with your gun or toss a grenade in an enemy's direction without needing to switch weapons would have felt entirely new, so in that regard, making sure even FPS veterans were fully aware of these new and exciting additions does make some sense. At some point during the Pillar of Autumn, you'll also likely hear this line. Keep your head down, there's two of us in here now, remember? And following the conclusion of the trilogy, I can safely say that this seemingly innocuous piece of dialogue is now one of my favourites in the entire trilogy. This first time you hear it, it wouldn't have conveyed too much beyond the idea that Cortana is startled and a little unsure of Master Chief, but following its later inclusion in Halo 3, it definitely becomes more significant. When you hear it in Halo 3, Cortana repeats the line in an almost loving tone of voice, which showed how far their relationship had come since the beginning of Combat Evolved. Just keep your head down. There's two of us in here now, remember? It was a brilliant idea by Bungie to include it a second time in the series, and it's a wonderful example of how one simple sentence can be used in different contexts in order to tell a story. It soon becomes apparent that the Covenant were very keen to deal with Master Chief before he awoke from cryo sleep, a nice visual indicator of just how important he really is. It looks like the Covenant wanted to catch you napping. <laughs> <laughs> and from here, things begin to quickly pick up pace again as you make a final push towards the lifeboats. There's even time for one last teachable moment. As I mentioned previously, the dedicated melee and grenade buttons were a pretty big change at the time, and after giving you two opportunities to acclimatise to the new melee option, not doing the same for grenades would have been a missed opportunity. Thankfully, however, the Pillar of Autumn's final encounter ends with a bang, as you come across a pile of grenades in an area designed specifically so you can practice your throwing. There's a good number of Covenant grouped together in a tight corridor, with plenty of scenery you can use as cover while you line things up, and hopefully by the time you've finished off your enemies, you should have a a pretty good idea of how the grenade button works. And with one final, rather epic cutscene, the Pillar of Autumn draws to a close. What is that thing, Lieutenant? Tell if I know. We're landing on it. The Autumn! She's been hit! I knew it. The Autumn's accelerating. Keys is going in manual. Hands up, everyone. This is it. We're entering the ring's atmosphere. Sure you wouldn't rather take a seat? We'll be fine. If I still had fingers, they'd be crossed. Halo Combat Evolved's second level is the first which takes place on Installation 04. Halo kicks off with Master Chief crash landing on Installation 04 following the Covenant attack on the Pillar of Autumn. Unfortunately, everyone else in the escape pod is dead. Yeah, there's... the impact. There's nothing we can do. And it's then up to Master Chief to search the area for any survivors. As you cross the bridge, a Covenant dropship flies overhead, and I like that Bungie funnels you away from the escape pod before the dropship arrives on the scene. Having only played the mission, the Pillar of Autumn prior, you won't have seen one of these dropships before, but you will encounter them a lot during Halo as the mission progresses, so here you're given an opportunity to watch one from a distance, so you then hopefully understand exactly how they function. You'll also be attacked by a Banshee, and you're then given the choice as to whether to simply take it down and move on, or also take on the Elite and Grunts inspecting the area surrounding the escape pod. Between them, the environment that was extraordinarily open for a console first-person shooter back in 2001, and the view of the ring itself, these early moments in the mission do a great job of imbuing Combat Evolved with an incredible sense of scale right off the bat. Moving on, you'll encounter another Elite flanked by a few Grunts, before rounding a corner where you'll discover another dropship. 
Having recently seen how they operate, you'll better understand this time what their purpose is, and after taking down another Covenant squad, you'll meet the mission's first group of marines. Their chatter has always been one of my favourite parts of Combat Evolved. Good to see you, sir. I thought we were the only ones who made it off the Pillar of Autumn. But there's not time for too much of a chinwag, as you're then tasked with fending off multiple dropships, which now also carry jackals, and this is the first time you will have seen this new feathered foe during the campaign. This area is your first proper introduction to the game's wonderful sandbox combat, and it's important that it's included prior to the mission opening up later on. It gives you the chance to get used to combat in a more open space than anything you've encountered prior, so you're then used to the concept ahead of being given more freedom a little later in the mission. With the Covenant dispatched, you witness more escape pods flying overhead, giving you your next objective, and Foehammer drops off a Warthog. You're again here given a little bit of time to get used to the vehicle before you encounter any Covenant while driving it, and there's also a slightly strange line from Cortana here. This cave is not a natural formation. Someone built it, so it must lead somewhere. Bungie originally intended for the cave to look a lot more natural than it does in the final release, and so Cortana's line here would have served the purpose, but in the end, it was decided that it would be easier to use Forerunner architecture instead. The line, however, was never removed, hence it feeling a little like Cortana is stating the obvious. The next area isn't hugely exciting, other than this elite I forgot about which made me jump out of my seat, but it is a classic example of Bungie's open to narrow design philosophy. One of the things that makes Combat Evolve so engaging is the way the game rapidly switches between narrow and open environments. It's evident in this mission as you move from the first encounter to this area and then back to a more expansive space, and you'll experience similar in just about every mission in the campaign. And at a higher level, it even happens between missions as well. The Pillar of Autumn is very narrow, and this is followed up by the much more open Halo. Events then transition to more enclosed spaces for truth and reconciliation, before the campaign again opens up during the silent cartographer. It is in my view the number one reason why Halo titles always feel so wonderfully paced, and it's a design philosophy that's still used in the series to this very day. Once you head outside again, things begin to really open up, and you're able to choose between three different areas to head to next, and it's here I want to quickly talk about Halo Infinite, because I think the way Halo is set up would be the perfect way to structure the game now it's been confirmed that it's moving to a much more open world. What you have here is essentially a hub area, which funnels you into three smaller, more directed encounters. You can choose to take them on in any order you please, but you'll always come back to this central area when moving from one to the next. Series that move from more linear experience experiences into more spacious environments between games often lose some of the tightly directed design which made them so engaging to begin with, but funneling players like Halo does ensures that isn't the case for its own open areas. You can still approach some of them from different paths, but these paths ensure that Bungie knows where you're going to be entering each engagement from. That makes the mission as a whole feel a lot more open than it actually is, but not to the point where individual areas feel completely random. The way these areas are designed can still be directed to a certain degree in terms of scripted events and enemy placement, but they also give you a much greater sense of freedom than you would otherwise experience. If Infinite was structured in a similar way, then this means the hub area could then be home to more freeform design where enemies could repopulate certain areas or special one-off events could take place. This is something Halo also does, for example when the dropship ferries new enemies into the area. My big worry with Infinite is that things might just be placed all over the map for you to approach in any direction, which means by design the encounters that take place in and around them will never feel quite as epic as they could do. If Infinite is completely open, then 343 Industries would never be sure of how exactly you will approach any given scenario, which in turn means events can never be too directed in terms of how they play out. Halo solves this problem beautifully by both giving you freedom, but also subtly taking it away when it needs to, and it works fantastically well. I'm by no means saying that a Halo Infinite that is truly open can't still be an amazing experience, but I think the blueprint Halo lays down in Combat Evolved is one which could still work incredibly well on a far larger scale. The encounters themselves aren't too dissimilar from the ones you fought towards the beginning of the level, but they're all slightly different in their own way. One pushes you to get up close and personal as you rescue marines underground, another directs you to high ground where you'll engage in long range combat, and the third feels like a mixture of the two, with a central structure in the middle which you can occupy if you prefer short range combat, surrounded by hills which encourage taking on enemies from a distance. The environments themselves aren't particularly varied, they all feature green hills and grey forerunner buildings, but the way they're structured to encourage you to try different styles of combat I really, really like. 
There are also plenty of sniper rifles you can pick up in and around these areas, which I again think is a great example of why Halo's structure would work so perfectly for Infinite. Bungie knows that there are plenty of opportunities to snipe enemies from a distance during this section, so it gives you the tools to do just that. They essentially use the weapons available in the environment as you explore the area to direct your playstyle. You don't have to use the sniper rifle of course, but I'd imagine most will, at least on their very first playthrough. And speaking of the sniper rifle, this section also acts as something of a training area for Truth and Reconciliation. Here you have plenty of opportunities to put the sniper rifle through its paces from a safe distance and get used to how it works, before you're then tasked with being a little bit sneakier and using it to its fullest potential during the following mission. Once all three sets of marines have been saved, Halo draws to a close. Truth and Reconciliation is next, and it begins with a brief briefing. The enemy has captured Captain Keys and are holding him aboard one of their cruisers, the Truth and Reconciliation. The ship is currently holding position approximately 300 meters above the other end of this plateau. So how do we get inside the ship if it's in the air? The Corps issued me a rifle, not wings. There's a gravity lift that ferries troops and supplies between the ship and the surface. That's our ticket in. Once we get inside the ship, I should be able to lock on to the tracking signal from Captain Key's neural implants. Something this mission, and indeed most of the rest of Combat Evolved, does so well is keep exposition entertaining, but also brief and to the point, and this mission's opening is a great example of that. There's little time to dwell on this wonderfully functional storytelling, however, as you're immediately tasked with stealthily taking down as many Covenant as you can using your sniper rifle. It's worth noting that this likely won't be your first time using the weapon either. The preceding mission Halo has several which can be found during its latter stages, and I like to think that was a conscious decision on Bungie's part. You're given the opportunity to get a feel for the sniper rifle during Halo, before Truth and Reconciliation ups the ante by asking you to remain consistent over over a longer period of time while facing a greater number of enemies. And just in case you haven't used the sniper rifle yet, this first encounter is staged in such a way that you still have some time to get accustomed to it and are able to choose at the very least your first shot before other enemies become hostile. The first three areas you move through during this section feature a few clever design choices that may not be too obvious but help keep the mission consistently engaging. The first of these is the way enemies and geography are used to signpost where you need to go next, to make sure you never struggle to find your way, and to help keep the mission's pace relatively high. After taking out the first Covenant squad you come across, a group of grunts rushes to confront you from a nearby path, which focuses your attention on where you need to head next. This trick is also used at the end of the second big encounter to similar effect, as another group of grunts emerges to attack you, again highlighting the route forwards. And in this third, larger area, the bridge and the slope path below it are used in a similar manner to direct you to where you need to go, albeit it with some lights thrown in around the path in question just to ensure you don't miss it. There's also a nice feeling of escalation to encounters during this first half, with the three areas also getting progressively larger and presenting a more complex challenge each time. In the first area, you're given the upper hand and the opportunity to thin the Covenant's ranks from a distance. They only become aware of your presence when you make a mistake, and so how difficult the encounter ends up being is really down to you. It becomes much harder to stay undetected for too long in the second area, but to counteract this, you're given more room to manoeuvre after making your way through the first narrow section, which means your sniper rifle remains useful even when the Covenant are aware of your presence. The third area then combines elements of both previous encounters. Like the first, there's a path you can use to move forward undetected, which again gives you the opportunity to stealthily take out as many Covenant as you can. The main part of the area, however, is on a similar scale to the second, which means you'll need to be much more aware of your surroundings, and it even throws in a twist of its own with a Covenant dropship arriving towards the end of the encounter to ferry in more adversaries. This entire opening segment is great, and it remains for me one of the most memorable in the entire series. Even though it can be a bit too easy to be discovered after the first area, Truth and Reconciliation's beginning is nonetheless a brilliant example of why Combat Evolve's first half in particular is one of the strongest in any first-person shooter I can think of. You've had the explosive start on the Pillar of Autumn, a more open affair during Halo, and here Bungie narrows down the game's scope for a short time as you take on a mission with a slightly more personal feel, and of course the excellent soundtrack which includes classics like Under Cover of Night pairs perfectly with the brown, barren areas you traverse to really tie everything together very nicely indeed. 
After managing to survive this trio of encounters, hopefully with some marines alive to assist you, you'll soon find yourself at the gravity lift you need to use to board the Truth and Reconciliation, and after clearing out the surrounding area, you'll then take on wave after wave of Covenant squads who enter the arena using the grav lift. On higher difficulties especially, this can be a tough fight, but I do also think it's a fair one. Enemies enter the fray slap bang in the middle of things, putting them on the back foot straight away, and the area's large circular construction provides ample opportunities for you to use your sniper rifle to thin the Covenant's ranks from afar. Unfortunately, while the encounter is an engaging affair at first, the amount of squads which need to be defeated means it does begin to become a little repetitive towards its end, and I think it could have been cut down a little in length without losing any of its charm. It does end on a bang at least, as the soundtrack kicks up a notch and the very first hunters ever featured in Halo are introduced. Again, much like the previous waves of enemies, this is a tough fight, but ultimately also a fair one. The hunter's fuel rod cannons have a fairly slow rate of fire and are easy enough to dodge from a distance, which means you're not put under too much pressure while trying to come up with a strategy for taking down this dangerous new foe. Of course, we all now know that a single pistol or sniper rifle shot to the exposed orange area on their back will do the job quickly and easily, but I think Bungie was wise to set up this first encounter with the Hunters like this, in order to give first-time players a chance to get used to them. Once the Hunters have been dispatched, more Marines are ferried in by Fohammer. Cortana to Echo 419. We've reached the gravity lift and are ready for reinforcements. Copy that, Cortana. Hold tight, gentlemen. Fohammer out. And it's very important these marines are introduced when they are, and I'll elaborate on why in just a tick. After using the grav lift to board the Truth and Reconciliation, one of the marines says it seems too quiet, and he's absolutely right. Soon enough, an elite with a sword will arrive on the scene and promptly begin taking down as many marines as he can. Much like the hunters lose some of their impact once you know the trick to beating them, this set piece is also less effective on repeat playthroughs due to it leaning heavily into its surprise factor, but every game needs a few moments like these, and this is one of the best. It's here that the reason Fohammer dropped off the marines prior to using the grav lift becomes clear as well. If those marines aren't dropped off and no others survived from the opening sections, then it wouldn't make for a particularly exciting set piece on the ship just moments later. By including them, Bungie makes sure that the sword elite in question has a ready supply of marines to slay, regardless of how well you did during the sections leading up to it. Unfortunately, from here, Truth and Reconciliation takes something of a nosedive. In my mind, Halo Combat Evolved has always been comprised of two acts. The first covers everything up until 343 Guilty Spark, and it's during that first half where the game undoubtedly shines brightest. There is a great deal of variety, not just during the mission's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, but in their aesthetics as well, and each feels like a carefully curated experience. Halo's second act marks the point where things begin to get a little repetitive, with environments often simply being retreads of those you've already visited, and encounters sometimes feeling quite samey thanks to the Flood being a less subtle enemy than the Covenant. That being said, there are a few places during Combat Evolve's first half where you can see that issue with repetition beginning to creep in. Assault on the Control Room's indoor sections are a great example of it, and it's definitely present during Truth and Reconciliation's latter stages as well. Between arriving on the ship and reaching the end of the mission, the vast majority of your time will be spent moving through identical purple hallways occasionally punctuated by slightly more open areas, and compared to the mission's first half, which wasn't perfect but was certainly memorable, it falls rather flat. However, there is a nice set piece around the midway point of your time spent on the ship, as you and your squad are ambushed by the Covenant in an aircraft hangar. In addition to the sequence with the sword-wielding elite earlier on, and a couple of parts featuring invisible elites later, this is one of the times during the mission where it feels like the idea of infiltrating an enemy ship actually matches up with what's happening in gameplay terms, as you find yourself overwhelmed by a foe who has quite clearly used their knowledge of their surroundings to their advantage. It's during these brief sequences that this this part of the mission does occasionally come alive, if just for a moment or two. There's also a solid bit of escalation at the end of this encounter, as you're tasked with taking down another pair of hunters in a much smaller space than when you first met them, although Bungie does still give you an advantage by placing an overshield nearby, something they do again during your third meeting with the enemy, during the next mission, the Silent Cartographer. After more incredibly uninspiring purple corridors, you'll eventually find the cells where Keys and some fellow marines are being held, at which point another cutscene kicks in. 
While the Covenant had us locked up in here, I overheard the guards talking about this ring world. They call it Halo. One moment, sir. Accessing the Covenant battle net. According to the data in their networks, the ring has some kind of deep religious significance. If I'm analyzing this correctly, they believe that Halo is some kind of weapon, one with vast, unimaginable power. Yeah, that's true. Covenant kept saying that whoever controls Halo controls the fate of the universe. Like the scene at the beginning of the mission, this one does a good job of doling out exposition without slowing down the pace of proceedings too much. In my view, the biggest step up between Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2 was the storytelling, with 2 weaving a much more complex narrative. And while I do think 2's story is much more nuanced than that of its predecessor, and it is told in a far more cinematic manner, I do still think there's a certain charm in the way Halo Combat Evolved handles its own story. What it lacks in depth and style, it makes up for in charm and succinctness, and while on the whole it is a simpler affair than later games, I must confess that I still hold it in quite high regard in spite of that. There's a final short section to get through following your rescue of keys, and you guessed it, it involves making your way through the same hallways you've just fought through, with the goal of reaching the hangar and stealing a dropship to use in your escape. The AI of Keys and the rest of his squad is absolutely terrible. I only played through this mission on normal when recording footage for this video, but even then, actually getting Keys to stay close to you and not quite a distance behind was infuriating, and this section is one that is also burned into my mind from when I previously played the mission alone on Legendary. There's not much else to say other than it is so very, very unnecessarily irritating. What's actually rather great, on the other hand, is the cutscene which concludes Truth and Reconciliation. It's only a short one, but after having perhaps struggled with the hunters you'd previously encountered during the mission, watching a couple of them get crushed might have been for many somewhat cathartic. Hang on. Nice one, sir. Time for a little payback. And as Master Chief, Keys, and the rest of the squad make their escape, Truth and Reconciliation draws to a close. While Keys and team search for a weapons cache, Master Chief and Cortana look for Halo's map room. The silent cartographer begins with views of the island and a summary of the mission, giving you a good idea of what you need to do and what the area itself looks like. The Covenant believe that what they call the silent cartographer is somewhere under this island. The cartographer is a map room that will lead us to Halo's control center. The island has multiple structures and installations. One of them contains the map room. Everything's calm in the Pelican to begin with, but it doesn't stay that way for long, as Halo has its very own D-Day moment, with the game's theme kicking into gear and a beach swarming with Covenants coming into view. Beach scenes in Halo games have become something of a running theme over the years. Halo 3's The Covenant features one, as does Halo Reach's Long Night of Solace, but it all began with the silent cartographer. What always shines through for me when playing this mission is how brilliant the level design in this opening scene is. You start a short distance away from the action, so you have plenty of time to survey the scene ahead of you, which is useful given how little cover there is on offer, but the real star of the show during this section is the enemy placement. The beach is a rather large, open environment, but the majority of enemies you'll face are clustered in the middle of it. It's a clever decision by Bungie as it funnels you down the centre of the map to fight the Covenant and ensures that while the area feels expansive, the pace of the encounter never slows down due to the area's size. You feel like you've been involved in a fast-paced battle across a large area fighting alongside plenty of marines, but in reality most of the action actually takes place within a fairly small part of the beach. I doubt most would have thought to do this the first time they played the mission, but it is worth noting that you can simply turn around and head in the opposite direction as soon as you leave the Pelican. Eventually you'll discover a pair of dead marines, some supplies and a warthog, and I do wonder whether Bungie included the warthog here to account for the fact that some players may choose this option. As we'll see momentarily, taking the correct path up the beach ends with Fohammer arriving to drop off a warthog, and so I would guess that Bungie left one here to make sure you still had access to a vehicle even if you fled the beach and never saw that scene play out. As mentioned, if you take the intended path of progression, Fohammer delivers a warthog, helpfully facing in the direction you need to head in next. 
However, it's worth noting that you again don't actually have to follow the intended path here either. The obvious place to head next is to the facility housing the map room itself. After all, it's the next building you'll find if you continue on round the island, but you don't have to go there first. If you continue on past it to the dead marines and warthog encountered earlier, you can skip the first visit to the map room completely and go straight to the security room instead. And if you do, there's even a slightly different line from Cortana to account for it. Here's what she says if you visit the map room first. Use the hollow panel to shut down the security system. And here's how it changes if you don't. This isn't the map room. Analyzing. This is a security override station for the main facility, located somewhere else on this island. Shut the system down so the Covenant won't be able to lock us out. I think it's really lovely that Bungie accounted for both choices, and the little touches like this or the fact you don't even have to take part in the beach encounter go a long way towards making the silent cartographer feel like a much less linear experience. Most of Halo's missions tend to be very much about heading from point A to point B, but the sandbox style used during the Silent Cartographer works very well indeed. The mission Halo earlier in the campaign does also do it to an extent during its second half as well, but the Silent Cartographer is without doubt where this style of mission shines brightest. We won't focus on the security room anymore for now, and we'll instead head back to the map room. As you approach it, you'll see a Covenant ship dropping off troops, and this is a great example of how Bungie makes the Silent Cartographer feel more alive by having events occur around you that seemingly would have happened whether you were present or not, and I'll point out a few more examples of this as we continue. The first visit to the map room isn't the most fruitful, although catching a glimpse of an elite armed with a sword does give you a small preview of what to expect later in the mission, and after being locked out of the depths of the facility, you have no other choice than to head back to your warthog and continue on to where the security room is located. I absolutely love this ramp just before you find the path leading deeper into the island. It is absolutely begging to be used, and I certainly didn't give driving straight up it a second thought. That is, until I was in mid-air and realised that I was going to land slap bang in the middle of a group of Covenant. Not only is this a great gotcha moment in that it leaves you in a bit of a pickle, but it's also smart from a design perspective as you land right next to the path you need to take once the Covenant have been dispatched. The route to the security room isn't the most obvious in the world, so I like the way that the map's layout pushes you in the right direction, albeit with a bit of a surprise thrown in. The next few encounters you fight your way through have that lovely open to narrow ebb and flow that Bungie has always done so wonderfully. You fight the Covenant below the ramp in an open area, then take on more in a narrow section before meeting the Hunters in an area which is again very spacious. The area housing the Hunters also makes a lot of sense in terms of its individual design in that you're given fair warning before you actually have to engage them. You can collect supplies from the two dead marines and scope out the area before taking them on, and it also allows you to fight them in a fairly spacious area before you meet two in a much more confined space soon after. Another bottleneck similar to the narrow section earlier follows, which again helps mix things up and stops the mission feeling like a long series of only open encounters, before you make your way through one more wider area and head inside to find the security room, the entrance to which is highlighted by the groups of grunts which emerge. Before arriving at the security room itself, you'll encounter a second pair of hunters. Much like the first encounter not long ago, this is very cleverly designed and is again intended to mix up the pace of the level. You are able to take on the previous duo in a much safer environment with all the space you could possibly need, but now Bungie offers up a much tougher challenge. Instead of dancing around them in a wide open space, this time you have to take them down in one which is far, far smaller and features several obstacles. The first encounter was easier so you could practice dealing with them, and this second is designed to be much more daunting, ramping up the difficulty to keep things engaging. This area also marks a sharp shift in tone compared to what came before. By this point you should be feeling pretty pumped up. Things began with the fantastic beach scene and you've slaughtered plenty of Covenant since, but now a much bleaker soundtrack kicks in, which combines well with the interior as a whole. It's a far darker place than the colourful exterior locations you've previously encountered, and once you've used the security room to unlock the doors leading to the map room, things become even more unsettling. You're again shown the elite wielding a sword, just to remind you that you will have to face him at some point. You hear this frantic message over the radio. Mayday! Mayday! Dropship Bravo 22 taking enemy fire! Repeat, we are under heavy fire and are losing altitude! Understood. We're on our way. And you're even ambushed by a group of invisible elites. 
As you exit the building, you'll no doubt notice the pelican you just heard over the radio now lying in ruins nearby, although Cortana does also highlight it too to make sure that you spot it. Chief, Bravo 22 was bringing us some heavy weapons. After I saw we were up against hunters, I thought you could use them. Let's move down the beach. Keep an eye out for any cargo we can salvage. I mentioned the Covenant dropship helping the island feel like a living, breathing place, and the crashed Pelican is another great example of that. And there's also a rocket launcher in the wreckage too, which puts a little power back into your hands after what was quite an intense series of encounters prior. After taking down two more hunters and heading through the previously locked door, you get this brief cutscene. You heard about the silent cartographer being somewhere under the island at the start of the mission, so it's nice that this scene is thrown in to really demonstrate that what's below ground is just as expansive as what's on the surface. Bungie then continues to play with this feeling of isolation as you try and take out as many Covenant as you can without being spotted in an area where you feel very much alone. It ticks the last box in terms of showing you everything Halo has to offer within a single level. You have action-packed scenes like the beach, vehicular sections, the more standard moment-to-moment -moment fights against the Covenant, an almost oppressive atmosphere in the security room, and finally, stealth. I do, however, have two issues with this section. Firstly, should these marines really be down here? There may well be something I've missed, but I was under the impression the Covenant got to the map room first and had it well guarded, so I'm not sure how they actually got there. My second issue is that like many parts of Halo based in Forerunner structures, it can be confusing to navigate at times. Given the cutscene moments prior and the fact that this is the first big Forerunner facility you explore, I'd imagine the tangled web of paths was Bungie attempting to make the area feel like a strange, alien place. Unfortunately, however, what it actually highlights is a problem that exists throughout much of Halo's indoor sections, which is a clear lack of waypointing. Dodgy waypointing or not, you will eventually find the map room where another short scene plays out, followed by a radio message that perhaps foreshadows the fact that Captain Keys and his squad have run into some trouble. Cortana to Captain Keys. The captain has dropped out of contact, Cortana. His ship may be out of range or having equipment problems. Keep trying. Let me know when you've re-established contact, and then tell him that the Master Chief and I have determined the location of the control center. We'll be heading there as soon as we're topside. Affirmative. Bone hammer out. Which you'll later find out during 343 Guilty Spark is most certainly the case. Making your way out of the facility, a huge group of Covenant attack while the more rock-orientated version of Halo's theme kicks in. I like to think that this next part of the mission serves a secondary purpose beyond simply quickening the pace as you make your way out of what is a somewhat uninspiring environment. Having nearly fought your way out of the building, you may once again be feeling pretty badass and will have most likely forgotten about the sword-wielding elite, who at this point hasn't been seen in quite some time, which makes his positioning round a corner where you won't notice him until the last minute such a great idea. I don't know about the rest of you, but I was scared half to death when I saw him for the first time, which is no doubt exactly what he was designed to do. And after one final face-off with a group of Covenant, including more invisible elites, the silent cartographer draws to a close. Except, there are two more changes to this level yet to find. I've already highlighted the Banshee and the Crashed Pelican as being two examples of how Bungie makes it feel like events are happening in the background, but it doesn't end there. If you head back to the beach from the start of the mission and check the area where Fohammer dropped off a Warthog, you'll find that all the Marines you left there are now dead. What exactly happened to them after you left to explore the rest of the island is never revealed, but it makes for a very grim discovery nonetheless. There's also a group of jackals in the circular area where you fought two hunters, along with a dropship waiting nearby. Whether the two are related in some way, I'm not sure, but I'd definitely love to know the reason behind their inclusions. Anyway, back to the story at hand, as Fohammer ferries Chief to nearby the installation's control room, which is where Assault on the Control Room kicks off. The mission begins with a great introductory scene involving a terrified grunt. After which you're left to your own devices to explore the sprawling Forerunner structure ahead of you. There's nothing particularly wrong with this opening encounter, and the layout of the area does give you options in terms of how you move around it. However, by the time you manage to get to the end of the mission, I think it's fair to say that you'll probably be completely and utterly bored by it and the many, many other very similar examples you come across. 
The same can again be said of the bridge sequence which follows. It's another type of area you will know like the back of your hand by the time the mission concludes. Stepping foot on the bridge, a pelican carrying a warthog passes by. This is Fire Team Zulu requesting immediate assistance from any UNSC forces. Does anyone copy? Over. I didn't think there were any human forces left on this part of the ring. Cortana to Fire Team Zulu. I read you. Fire Team Zulu, this is Cortana. Hold position. We're on our way. Roger that. Make it quick. And I do like that it almost draws your attention to the area far below where you're standing, an area you'll eventually find yourself in not long after. What always captured my imagination when I first played Combat Evolved many years ago was its incredible sense of scale compared to a lot of other first-person shooters on the market at the time. The game's second mission, Halo, is of course the example many will point to when they talk about this side of things, and rightly so. Stepping out on the seemingly endless ring for the first time was an incredible experience, but for me, the levels that really drive that idea home are Assault on the Control Room and the Silent Cartographer before it. The Silent Cartographer lets you loose on an island you can approach in any number of ways, while Assault on the Control Room is a more linear affair which often gives you glimpses of areas some distance away that you'll eventually end up battling your way across. The Pelican draws your attention to the area below and the Warthog helps lend a feeling of consistency as it's one you'll very soon be given the opportunity to get behind the wheel of when you reach the snow-covered valley below. Progressing through another area near identical to that you found yourself in at the start of the mission, you'll find a lift which takes you to ground level, and following one more repetitive circular room, which this time does give you the opportunity to rack up a few stealth kills, you'll finally find yourself out in the open. And this is where the fun really begins. I've nothing but good things to say about the majority of these sections. The first example is very thoughtfully laid out, in that Bungie uses enemy placement and the action in general to help guide you. In fact, I think it might be one of the best designed encounters in the entire game. The first grunt in a turret you stumble upon will begin firing on a group of nearby marines, and I'm sure this was a deliberate decision to help draw your attention to them and the weapons cache which lies nearby. From there, you're given an amazing range of options for how to approach the area. You can pick up a sniper rifle or rocket launcher or both. You can hop in the warthog with some of the marines and start causing havoc, or if you prefer to go it alone, take control of one of the ghosts nearby. The enemies in another turret close by shepherd you forward, and the wraith a little further away makes it clear where you need to go next, as does another squad of Covenant which emerges in the distance. It's frantic, it gives you the most choice in how to tackle events that you've been given up to this point, and Bungie positions everything perfectly so the encounter's pace never slows down despite the area's size. It's absolutely fantastic. Once that initial skirmish is done and dusted, you'll meet even more marines, including Johnson, and Bungie ramps things up even more as you get your hands on a scorpion. Assault on the Control Room is the only mission in the game which allows you to take control of one, which I think is a bit of a shame considering how entertaining its pinpoint accurate turret is to use but I think it does help make the level feel more unique as well, which is no bad thing. Again, you're given plenty of options too. There's more weapons and ammo so you can cater your loadout to your preferred playstyle, especially useful if you want to progress on foot. There's more ghosts, and it even features two different routes you can take leading to the next area, where Bungie continues to expertly increase encounter difficulty as you face another wraith, more turrets and ghosts, and even a banshee, all within a more tightly packed environment. Taking down a pair of hunters, the first of many you'll dispatch during Assault on the Control Room, the mission with the most in the entire game by far, an indoor area is thrown in to break up the action, and there's a nice piece of environmental storytelling here that it's very easy to miss. If you head to the right when entering, you'll likely spot a group of marines lying dead alongside Covenant including a hunter, and it's clear a fairly large firefight had recently occurred between the two groups. 343 Guilty Spark is of course the king of environmental storytelling, and no other mission comes close to matching it, but it's great that that there's still the odd example alluding to unseen events in other missions, even if they are often few and far between. I do also like this area because it does punish you if you don't take time to survey things properly. The temptation of course is to head straight across the bridge, but if you do so, you might find yourself being very quickly overrun. Fingers crossed you still have a sniper rifle to hand, and staying calm and taking out enemies from a distance before crossing certainly makes this section much less of a pain to get through than it otherwise would be. Even during a mission which puts a huge emphasis on you pushing forward forward and getting stuck in, here you're reminded that taking a few moments to plan your attack may pay dividends, and if you do so, you're rewarded accordingly. Heading back outside, you're tasked with navigating the longest open stretch in the mission, and I'm in two minds as to whether it goes on a little too long or not. I can see the design philosophy behind what Bungie were trying to accomplish with Assault on the Control Room. The outdoor sections are clearly meant to encourage you to constantly use vehicles due to their enormous size, with the indoor sections included to break things up, but I don't think they ever get the balance quite right when it 
comes to either. Everything up until this point is pretty great, and there's enough variety that each encounter feels fresh, but from here on out you'll encounter long stretches doing one or the other, which I think could have been cut down a little in size. Although this part of the mission definitely isn't as egregious as the long indoor slog which comes later, with encounter design remaining relatively varied throughout. The set piece during which you meet another group of marines before being ambushed from behind is a good one, and the opportunity to pick up active camo and stealth your way through an on-foot section is appreciated, but I think at this stage you've seen a lot of what's on offer already, and with the mission taking somewhere in the region of 30 to 45 minutes to get through, it could stand to be cut down a little. That being said, once you begin traversing the indoor environments which follow, you'll wish you were back outside having fun in the snow. I want to take a minute here to highlight just how bad it gets. At the beginning of the mission you travelled through the circular room on three separate occasions and crossed a single bridge, and here proceedings begin with a circular room, followed by a lift, and another circular room. You then reach another bridge, and after surviving that encounter you go through, you guessed it, another circular room, and another circular room, swiftly followed by another bridge, before Bungie finally mixes things up with, nothing, I'm kidding, it's another circular room. Sorry scratch that, another two circular rooms. To be fair to Bungie, they do try to vary the encounter designs within these repetitive spaces, and some of them are semi-engaging, the two bridges being the best examples, where you first have to also fight the Covenant on a bridge parallel to the one you're on, before doing the same again while dodging Hunter's fuel rod cannons on a second. You'll also face different groups of enemies in the circular rooms, including invisible elites and hunters, but to be frank, it's a brutally boring slog of a section which I genuinely think could have been removed altogether without the mission suffering whatsoever, especially given its ridiculously long runtime I touched on earlier. During the second half of Combat Evolved, there is a lot of repetition. The library is very long and samey, and two betrayals, keys and the more revisit familiar locations, albeit with a flood-based twist. Bungie clearly ran out of time when it came to developing the second half of the game, which is evident in how varied its first half is compared to its second, and while I don't think that makes things better, I can at least understand why it happened. But in Assault on the Control Room, to include such an extreme amount of repetition seems like a very bizarre decision. Cutting out the entire indoor section just discussed, and perhaps some of the earlier, long outdoor section as well, wouldn't exactly have left them with a mission much shorter than those featured in the rest of Halo. If anything, it would make the level a much more enjoyable experience, and maybe one of the very best in the game. A series of big, open battles punctuated by the occasional brief indoor section to help break up its flow. Instead, they decide to repeat things over and over again where it really wasn't needed, and I'd be intrigued to learn more about the thought process behind this decision, as I can't help but think that surely one or two people during development must have mentioned how arduous it often is, especially when compared to the four missions preceding it, which are in my view some of the best in the series. Anyways, enough complaining for now, as the next sequence is one I find quite interesting. Yes, it's another bridge, but it's one a little bit different from those you've encountered so far. As you enter it, you might notice a banshee sitting empty just begging to be driven, and if you're a speedy chap like I am, you should be able to get there before the elite patrolling nearby can do similar. If you do manage it, you're then free to fly around the area and explore below the bridge as you see fit, with only the enemies on the snow spawning in, while the structure leading up to the control room remains unguarded. The Covenant who are meant to be there must must have been on a break or something. There's not a huge amount you can do with the Banshee as part of the sequence break beyond heading to the control room straight away, but it's a nice little skip for those who manage to find it, and it again highlights just how great the mission can be during the more one-off situations you find yourself in. If you're unfortunate enough not to manage to steal the Banshee, then you'll have to make your way indoors yet again for another two circular rooms before you find yourself outside for the mission's final battle as you take out Covenant around a huge forerunner structure and fight your way up to its summit. I'm a massive fan of Assault on the Control Room's final encounter, you open a huge set of doors and are suddenly confronted by a ridiculous number of Covenant as the soundtrack kicks fully into gear. It's a bit of a shock to say the least, and hopefully you're like me and have plenty of rockets to hand, which makes for a particularly enjoyable last hurrah. At very long last you enter the control room itself, at which point a scene between Cortana and Chief begins, one of the few in a mission which is also generally very light on story. It's one of the best in the entire game, even if Cortana maybe could have given Chief a little more information about what he was about to encounter before sending him off to stop the flood, and it leaves things on a massive cliffhanger as the mission draws to a close. It's a very solid way to close out the first half of the game. Yes, the Forerunner built this place, what they called a fortress world, in order to... Wait. No, that can't be. 
Oh, those Covenant fools. They must have known. There must have been signs. Slow down. You're losing me. The Covenant found something. Buried in this ring. Something horrible. And now, they're afraid. Something buried? Where? The Captain. We've got to stop the Captain. Keys? What the weapons we... cache he's looking for. It's not really... We can't let him get inside. I don't understand. There's no time. Get out of here. Find keys. Stop him. Before it's too late. It's now time for my favourite mission in the entirety of Halo, 343 Guilty Spark, a horror masterclass. Bungie immediately begins developing a sense of dread by combining the chapter title Well Enough Alone with scenes of the Covenant fleeing something. On any other occasion, seeing the Covenant so terrified would most definitely be a good thing, but after Cortana's warning at the end of the previous mission, here not so much. Well Enough Alone is a chapter title taken from the longer phrase should have left well enough alone, and is fitting not only because of what transpires later on in the mission, but also because you are quite literally alone. You you left Cortana behind in the control room and there's not a marine in sight. It's just you, the Covenant, the Swamp and a human voice coming from somewhere nearby. Investigating further, you'll find a downed pelican, and as you draw closer, you're able to listen to a radio message which won't do much to reassure you. Although that being said, a shotgun can be found here if you're playing on easy difficulty, which might make you feel a little bit better, I suppose. These opening scenes mark the start of a sharp tonal shift in Halo's campaign. The majority of the game's missions up until this point featured plenty of bright, open spaces, and you often had plenty of marines on hand to help keep you company as well. There were some narrow environments you traversed alone, but other than the odd run-in with invisible elites, these never tended to be much more threatening than any other encounter. 343 Guilty Spark Swamp, on the other hand, is a narrow environment which feels very threatening indeed. It's claustrophobic, visibility is reduced, and it generally feels like an extremely oppressive place. Missions like the Silent Cartographer and Assault on the Control Room made you really feel like a super soldier leading into 343 Guilty Spark, but as you begin to make your way through the swamp, you may begin to feel less powerful and a lot more vulnerable. The radio message in the Downed Pelican mentioned some new kind of hostile, and although what exactly this new kind of hostile is won't be revealed for a while yet, Bungie does throw in a few hints of what's to come for those paying attention to what's going on around them. As you explore the swamp, you might notice multiple yellow dots appear on your radar in the bottom left corner of the screen. These usually indicate where other marines are located on the map, but there's not a marine in sight. You may also notice strange figures moving around in the shadows, which certainly don't look like Covenant figures it's possible to miss entirely if you're not switched on. This one watches you from a vantage point, there's more to be spotted in two different places almost immediately after, directly ahead of you and on an inaccessible ridge nearby, and if you're really keeping an eye out, you may also spy one darting through the swamp as well. You'll also likely come across a downed Covenant dropship, an unusual sight indeed, and between it and the earlier scenes of grunts and jackals fleeing, it's clear that the Covenant are having a fairly bad time. Bungie including these details so early on in the mission is vital to 343 Guilty Spark working as well as it does. Firstly, because they help increase tension at a very early point in the level, but not in a manner which feels forced or gratuitous, and also because they hopefully quickly teach you that the little details are important. 343 Guilty Spark arguably does more environmental storytelling than any other mission in Combat Evolve's campaign, and by packing this small space at its start with so many things to spot, Bungie pushes you to keep an eye out for more during the rest of the mission's runtime. Those not paying attention to their surroundings will miss quite a bit, whereas those who are more observant will quickly gain an understanding of what Bungie is trying to achieve and have a far more rewarding experience as a result. To a certain extent at least, you get out of 343 Guilty Spark what you're willing to put in. As you approach the facility itself, the sound of gunfire and explosions cuts through the air, muzzle flashes light up the swamp, and you'll catch sight of more Covenant running for their lives. The gunshots in question could have come from Keyes' team as they entered the facility, but given that earlier on you can spot creatures which are eventually revealed to be the Flood, I'd say it's much more likely that it's them setting a trap for Master Chief. 
But before heading inside to hopefully find out exactly who was doing the shooting, you'll need to take out the Covenant stragglers outside, and you might notice something else here, or you may have already noticed it when fighting the few Covenants you've already encountered. There's not an Elite in sight. Elites act as leaders for the numerous Covenant squads you'll encounter during Halo's campaign, and the majority will have at least one in their ranks, but so far during 343 Guilty Spark, they have been suspiciously absent, and things continue to get even more unsettling once the Covenant have been dispatched, with noises that sound suspiciously flood-like ringing out in the swamp if you linger for a moment or two. This continued attention Bungie pays to building a dark, oppressive horror atmosphere throughout this opening section is absolutely fantastic, and I'd argue they do a better job of it than some horror games manage over a similar period of time. The atmosphere of the swamp itself probably would have been enough, but when combined with everything else I've mentioned, it makes for an incredibly strong opening that I'd wager will have had a great impact on most the first time they played the mission. As you finally make your way inside the facility and an elevator leading deeper inside rises to greet you, you'll no doubt be somewhat nervous about what's coming next, which is an unfamiliar feeling. Your Master Chief, one of humanity's finest, a man who has been blasting his way through wave after wave of Covenant for quite some time now. What could there possibly be down here that you haven't already conquered? But just as you're starting to really feel a palpable sense of dread, the pace of 343 Guilty Spark changes completely. The swamp was dark and terrifying, but now you're face to face with the Covenant again in an environment with far better visibility, and everything feels right in the world. There's still not an elite in sight, which is a little strange, but after a firefight or two you may almost begin to forget what you saw in the swamp. That is of course until you discover a strange yellow liquid dripping from the ceiling, the corpse of a jackal laying nearby, the walls painted with its blood, and dead Covenant who seemingly tried to unsuccessfully barricade themselves inside a room. There are even turrets and shields set up not to stop you from progressing further into the facility, but to seemingly stop something leaving it instead, and they're pointed at a door with a big red symbol on it. You most likely will have noticed this symbol dotted around the facility already, but they've always been blue instead of red, red of course being the colour for danger, and they haven't had a whole load of weaponry pointed at them either. And throughout all of these discoveries, there's no music used whatsoever. So often during Halo, the soundtrack will swell during pivotal moments, but throughout this entire section there's little to be heard other than the echoes of the facility itself. It really helps create a feeling of isolation as you continue to explore. At this point, you may quite rightfully be more than a little anxious about heading deeper into the facility, and you may even decide to head back to the swamp instead of progressing any further. So you take the elevator back up and head outside. Everything seems normal at first glance, until you notice the corpses of a number of marines which definitely weren't there previously, yet another sign that all is not well in this particular part of Installation 04. And so you head back inside the facility and continue to explore there, at which point you'll come across a crazed marine ranting about events which recently transpired. Stay back! Stay back! You're not turning me into one of those things! I'll blow your brains out! Get away from me! Don't touch me, you freaks! I won't be like you! I'll die first! Find your own hiding place! The monsters are everywhere! Now this is classic horror, the frenzied survivor of something babbling incoherently about what they've just witnessed. Intelligible enough that you understand something bad is about to happen, but not clear enough that you're certain what to expect. And judging by the horrendous scene which greets you once you leave him, whatever it is, you should be very, very concerned. The jackal you discovered earlier was not a particularly pleasant thing to find, but this is on a whole other level, and you might notice that among the dead, there's still not a single elite. Not far away, you'll come across another dead marine, followed by the discovery of one more as a cutscene kicks in. As an aside, it's a little odd that these marines are here given the Flood's love of using human bodies for their own nefarious means, but I'm okay with giving Bungie a little artistic license here and there given the overall quality of the level. As you watch the marine's video log, you get to relive your journey through the swamp and into the facility through someone else's eyes. The sequence featuring Keys and the rest of his squad feels very much like a tribute to James Cameron's Aliens and the scene in which Ripley watches marines being slaughtered via their video feeds. There's also a scene in which the squad discovers an elite whose chest has seemingly burst open, which again feels like one straight out of the Alien franchise, and one of the marines even says, I got a bad feeling about this.
a line used multiple times during Aliens. As the video feed draws near to its end, things take a turn for the worse as Keyes and his team meet the Flood, before it promptly ends. Once the video has concluded, you'll very quickly come to a horrifying realisation. You're in the same room as the Marine was in at the end of the footage. Bungie very cleverly gives you just enough time to worry, or indeed panic, about what you just witnessed, and to find the ammo and bloodstains left by the previous group on the floor nearby, before the Flood make their grand entrance. This encounter and those which follow up until you leave the facility are very, very well done in that there are three clear stages of escalation. First, you face infection forms, the weakest flood form, which gives you time to get used to a new type of playstyle. Up to this point, you fought the Covenant exclusively, which I'd say required more traditional combat tactics, whereas fighting the flood is much more about crowd control. Taking on the Covenant meant timing your attacks, utilising cover and choosing the right weapons, whereas successfully tackling the Flood means learning when it's best to back away, something the Infection Forms encourage right off the bat. Once you've got used to killing Infection Forms, it's time for things to ramp up a gear. After a few waves have been dispatched, the first Combat Forms then make an appearance, and you'll most likely suddenly realise why you've seen no Elites so far. They've all been turned into Flood. With infection and combat forms now on the prowl, you'll have to work a little harder to survive, something the Covenant isn't managing to do too well in the next room. It's important this encounter between the Covenant and the Flood is placed where it is, as it demonstrates clearly the new faction dynamics now the Flood have been introduced. You've probably already concluded that the Flood are out to kill everything, but it's made very obvious here, just in case you had any doubts. Bungie does also put some power back into your hands during this section by providing you with a shotgun, but they're not above making you suffer either. Heading back to the lift which brought you into the facility, you press the button to call it, at which point it comes crashing down in front of you. If you thought there was any chance of an easy escape, here your hopes are very quickly dashed. Thankfully, however, there is another elevator for you to make use of, but once you're on it, instead of it taking you out of the facility, it takes you even deeper inside, and there's plenty of Covenant blood splashed across the shaft, just in case you aren't already demoralised enough. Upon reaching the bottom, it's time for the third part of the encounter escalation I talked about earlier. First you faced infection forms, then things got a bit trickier with the introduction of combat forms, and finally you're now tasked with taking on combat forms with weapons. Not only is this fantastic encounter design in that Bungie gives you more time to adjust by using a gradual difficulty curve, but it also adds a layer of uncertainty. To begin with, you were just fighting relatively weak infection forms, and now the Flood is shooting at you. It makes you extremely extremely uncertain as to what might be coming next. Unfortunately, however, what comes next is probably the weakest part of 343 Guilty Spark, as you race through a number of very similar looking rooms and corridors as you try to find a way to escape the unfolding nightmare. At first, the environment does sort of work. It is grey and repetitive without doubt, but it does also put the focus squarely on the flood as opposed to your surroundings, which brings with it a certain increase in intensity. You're stuck in a maze-like environment with a horrifying foe who just won't stop coming. It's a very relentless experience, for a time at least. Eventually, however, it does begin to feel rather repetitive. Having played 343 Guilty Spark more times than I'd care to admit, I personally have no trouble finding my way around, but for first time players, I think the map has the potential to be a little too confusing considering the lack of overly obvious waypoints. But there is one bonus to spending maybe a little too long in the depths of the facility, and it's that there's more chance you'll notice this amazing little detail. In one of the facility's rooms, lying dead back to back, are two marines and two jackals, surrounded by a small stockpile of weapons and ammunition. The implication being that the four put their differences aside to fight together against a far more terrifying enemy, even if only for a few brief moments. It's perhaps my favourite of all the clever examples of environmental storytelling Bungie does during the mission, a detail perhaps missed by many that infers so much if you're paying attention to your surroundings. Continuing to battle through what may feel like a never-ending onslaught of flood, you'll eventually find another elevator and finally begin making your way back to the surface, where you'll find a squad of marines and can breathe at least a small sigh of relief. Sir, thank god you're here. We've been lost out here for hours. After we lost contact with the rest of the mission, we, we headed for the RV point and then these, these, these things, they ambushed us. We've got to get out of here.
After previously feeling like prey being hunted by a predator you not long ago did not even realise existed, here Bungie again puts some of the power back into your hands as you storm the swamp alongside the marines. Lulling you into a false sense of security is something Bungie did brilliantly at the start of the mission, where the dark and unsettling swamp gave way to fairly run-of-the-mill encounters with the Covenant inside the facility, and they do it extremely well here towards the end of 343 Guilty Spark as well. There are flood which need to be dispatched, but you're part of a large squad and you may begin to feel like everything isn't so bad, like the tide may finally be turning. That is until you enter a narrow path, your radar lights up, you're ambushed from all sides and I'd guess that newfound air of confidence you've found will quickly disappear. It's another classic horror moment that again feels like one which would be right at home in the Alien franchise. Thankfully, you're soon saved by the titular 343 Guilty Spark and a number of Sentinels as the mission reaches its conclusion. Thankfully, you don't have to spend any more time in the swamp, with Guilty Spark teleporting you to Halo's library. The library begins with a glimpse of the activation index, your end goal, and the briefest of explanations as to what you're meant to be doing. We must collect the index before we can activate the installation. From start to finish, this level is all about the Flood. While you will have seen much of what they have to offer during previous mission 343 Guilty Spark, I like that Bungie does immediately throw in a curveball as several carrier forms, a Flood variant you've yet to encounter, immediately arrive on the scene and begin waddling their way towards you. There's little time to breathe in the surroundings, no build-up before you're thrown into the thick of things, left alone to square off against these new abominations. As soon as you see them and hear the track Devil's Monster, the Flood's theme of sorts begin playing, you'll likely realise that you're in for a tough time. These opening moments make Bungie's modus operandi for the mission abundantly clear. 343 Guilty Spark may have been your new enemy's introduction, but it's here they will be given the opportunity to truly take centre stage. It's a shame then that the stage in question is one which ends up becoming quite stale quite quickly. The library is a featureless maze which seems never-ending, and because of that it soon loses its impact. When I think about standout level design in Halo Combat Evolved, I think of much of the silent cartographer, the first half of Truth and Reconciliation, and the lead up to the Flood's reveal in 343 Guilty Spark. Each example expands on the familiar Halo format by adding a memorable twist, such as giving you the opportunity to choose how you navigate an island, scaling up long-range combat across increasingly complex arenas, or subverting expectations through a shift in tone and the use of environmental storytelling. At first glance, the library threatens to be similarly unique. Its cold, nondescript hallways do an excellent job of demonstrating the incredible scale of the Forerunner facilities which sprawl across Installation 04, and for a short while, you might begin to feel a palpable sense of anticipation as you start to wonder how Bungie will build on this initial promise. It isn't the first time you'll have encountered an alien structure in Halo Combat Evolved, but it is by far the most alien out of any of them, and early on, that is exciting. Except, as you continue to progress, you'll find no further development, with aesthetic and structural variety both sorely lacking. And even if you're someone who places little value on either, some of the issues accompanying them will probably still manage to grate. One of the biggest is that quite often the library manages to achieve the amazing feat of being both very linear and very confusing at the same time. Its surroundings are consistently visually similar, which can make it difficult to figure out exactly where you are. The grey hallways provide few discernible landmarks for you to orientate yourself around, although Guilty Spark's guidance does sometimes help alleviate that problem, and the lack of distinction between its areas means it's harder than it really should be to ascertain which direction you should actually be heading in. Also, to call the majority of the areas you battle the Flood in combat arenas would be very generous to say the least. Most encounters take place in simple hallways or the odd smaller area you're forced to defend while waiting for a door to open, and aside from the occasional set of pillars hiding weapons or health packs, or the ridges offering the smallest pieces of verticality, most combat takes place at ground level and involves an awful lot of circle strafing. Keeping the overarching level design the same but tweaking a few of the micro details within different areas, adding more cover or verticality for example, I think would go a long way towards making 
the level more enjoyable. As you make your way through the seemingly endless facility, Guilty Spark will often chime in with an observation or two. His dialogue is the best part of the library. There's a massive amount to take in, and what he says builds out the wider world of Halo in just the right amount, whether that's giving insight into the nature of the Flood. The installation was specifically built to study and contain the Flood. Their survival as a race was dependent upon it. I am grateful to see that some of them survived to reproduce. Or dropping hints that the Forerunners may well have been humans themselves. <laughs> Puzzling. You brought such ineffective weapons to combat the Flood, despite the containment protocols. In the present, we know that the Forerunners certainly aren't the same species as us, but I remain convinced that Bungie's original plan was that they would be. There are just far too many hints that suggest so littered throughout Halo's campaign for me to believe otherwise. On the topic of aliens, one of the defining features of Halo Combat Evolved is the Covenant AI, which in 2001 felt like a huge step up from most console shooters, which usually included enemies who would tend to charge straight at you or stand still and fire in your direction. The Covenant communicates, they have a hierarchy on the battlefield, and they often genuinely seem to be trying to outthink you. The Flood are nothing like the Covenant. They are an enemy much more in the mould of those in a Doom or a Quake, a one-dimensional threat with few tactics. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, at certain points in Halo, they are a refreshing change from the Covenant, and I've always argued that the Flood are a brilliant enemy when utilised in levels containing a mix of different factions. Think the chaotic outdoor skirmishes in Two Betrayals, or the absolute carnage you witnessed during the Warthog run at the end of the moor. Even here on their own, for a short while they do entertain. The run and gun gameplay is different enough that it helps freshen things up, and I personally always get quite zoned in early on. The comparison to Doom and Quake, I think, is an apt one. Like those games, however, the library is not a varied enough environment in terms of both aesthetic and layout, and combined with the Flood, what you end up with is a clash between two elements which soon begin to both feel very repetitive. The library would have definitely been more bearable if you fought the Covenant, as encounters would require more thought. And likewise, the huge number of Flood would have been less boring to take on if the environments those battles took place in were more engaging. Unfortunately, what you get in the library is the unholy trifecta of repetitive level design, repetitive enemies, and repetitive encounters. The library always looks the same, the Flood are always going to rush towards you, and they always appear in similar circumstances, jumping from vents or shambling around corners and heading straight towards you. It ends up being rather tedious. Once you've experienced one encounter, you've really seen them all, barring a few during which you receive backup from groups of Sentinels, and that means in pure gameplay terms, it's a level which begins to wear thin very quickly. Also, with regards to repetition, who doesn't love being told to wait somewhere over and over again? The security doors have sealed automatically. I will go access the override to open them. Please wait here. I will deactivate the security lock. Wait here. Despite the mostly negative things I've had to say so far, I must at this point make a concession. I do think the level's core concept is an interesting one. The library is without doubt a very alien place, and the Flood are a very alien adversary, and during the mission's early stages in particular, you might find that unfamiliar mix to be quite oppressive. Previous levels featured a mix of Forerunner facilities and outdoor areas, and a decent amount of backup, and even 343 Guilty Spark had a squad or two of Marines hanging around to make you feel more at home. But there's no humanity within the confines of the library, and the Flood, an enemy which can at best be described as inhuman, do much to further the feeling of you being a small fish in a very large, but also very frightening pond. Much like the environment itself feels unlike anything you've encountered before, the Flood feel unlike any Anything you've fought before. You are no longer battling the Covenant, an enemy which somewhat mirrors humans in the way they use tactics and communicate, in settings that you'd grown accustomed to. Instead, you're taking on a foe that shares little in common with humans in an environment unlike anything you've traversed up to this point in the game. It takes you completely out of your comfort zone and makes you feel trapped. The Flood appear in such vast numbers throughout that they serve to make the library's huge hallways feel more enclosed than they actually are. Why they're called the Flood is clearly illustrated. They enter an area in great waves and consume everything in their path. You quickly begin to understand how relentless a force they actually are. 
You also take them on across a fairly long level, one that feels especially lengthy because of the distinct lack of changes in pace or environment which would otherwise break proceedings up into more digestible sections. The Silent Cartographer, for example, is essentially a level made up of three segments. The beach landing through to reaching the locked security door, finding the security console and returning to the unlocked door, and finally locating the map room before escaping. The library, on the other hand, feels like one long, unbroken stretch, which in fairness does perfectly mirror the enemies you encounter. Both are indistinct, everything blends together, and it never feels like the pressure lets up. Is it too long? Well, the answer to that question is a resounding yes, it far outstays its welcome, and in my view it probably would have worked better as a shorter segment at the end of 343 Guilty Spark, but thematically, it does still work. If the level design serves to make the library feel alien, and its flood-filled hallways help highlight your new enemy's overwhelming nature, then the library's length ensures you are mentally exhausted by the time the mission concludes. It gives you true insight into what a prolonged fight with the flood would have actually been like for Master Chief. To put it simply, by the time you finish the library, I suspect you're perhaps meant to feel worn out. Speaking of conclusions, I do also think the best encounter in the game is included right before the mission ends. An enormous set of doors open, and you're confronted by the largest group of Flood you've encountered. It's a wonderfully frantic final firefight, which serves as a reminder that even though you've taken them down in great numbers, they are not to be trifled with. And shooting your way through this final pack of horrors, Master Chief reaches the activation index, which signals the library's close. You may now retrieve the index. Protocol requires that I take possession of the index for transport. Your organic form renders you vulnerable to infection. The index must not fall into the hands of the flood before we reach the control room and activate the installation. With the activation index in hand, Two Betrayals begins with Master Chief ready to activate the installation. Returning to Halo's control room, however, there's a twist, as Cortana reveals that Halo itself is the failsafe against the Flood, and is designed to wipe out their food, all sentient life in the galaxy, which is where we all pick things up. Halo doesn't kill Flood, it kills their food. Humans, Covenant, whatever. We're all equally edible. The only way to stop the Flood is to starve them to death. And that's exactly what Halo is designed to do. Wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life. With Guilty Spark now your enemy, your first task is to take down a gaggle of angry sentinels. There's some pretty bread and butter game design here in that you begin the level wielding a plasma pistol, plasma weapons being especially effective against the sentinels. Prior to two betrayals, you'll have only fought alongside them during the end of 343 Guilty Spark and throughout the library, but you'll be taking on a lot of them moving forwards, so here developer Bungie lends a helping hand so you can quickly ascertain how to deal with them most effectively. Cortana informs Chief that the best course of action will be to detonate the Pillar of Autumn's fusion reactors to blow up the ring, and as you head outside, the Truth and Reconciliation suite kicks in, and Cortana explains how you can delay Guilty Spark, your objective for this mission. The machinery in these canyons are Halo's primary firing mechanisms. They consist of three phase pulse generators that amplify Halo's signal and allow it to fire deep into space. The power levels are enormous, I can't even begin to calculate the pulse's range. So, if we damage or destroy these generators, the monitor will need to repair them before Halo can be used. That should buy us some time. And since making your way to the bottom of this area is pretty similar to when you made your way up it at the end of Assault on the Control Room, I want to take a moment to touch on the music during this level. It's great. Two Betrayals includes some of my favourite tracks in the game. Indeed, it might be the strongest mission in terms of its track selection, and they're all used at just the right moment. My personal favourite is towards its conclusion, as you clamber up a hill into a darkened valley, with the Covenant and Flood locking horns ahead of you as Under Cover of Night kicks in, one of my favourite video game tracks of all time, and there's a ton of other great examples littered throughout.
Reaching the bottom, you'll have to take out more Covenant and a Wraith before you hop in a Banshee for the first time ever in the Halo series and head to the first of the three Phase Pulse generators, which you're forced to walk into to take out, removing your shield in the process. The battles immediately after you destroy each of them are fairly tricky on higher difficulties and can be a real source of frustration. Personally, I'd not be overly unhappy if they weren't there. During this first one, for example, if you only have human weapons to hand as you fight the Sentinels which are appear, you might have a pretty tough time. An extended period spent indoors is required to get to the next generator, beginning with a few quite simple skirmishes against the Covenant. If you've watched my previous piece covering Assault on the Control Room, which you can check by clicking the card on screen now, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of these sections. They consist of circular rooms, lots and lots of circular rooms, and bridges, and the level design is generally very uninspiring. However, replaying two betrayals for this video, something sprung to mind I'd actually never thought of before. Despite despite having played Halo Combat Evolved a frankly absurd number of times. The back half of Halo Combat Evolved is packed full of repetition, whether that's the imposing hallways of the library, the Covenant ship you explore for the majority of keys, the remains of the Pillar of Autumn featured during the Moor, or, of course, most of Two Betrayals. But Two Betrayals is the only one during which you go through a previous level backwards for pretty much its entire runtime, bar some detours to destroy the generators. And that got me thinking. In the past, I'd always just figured Bungie were running low on development time, and so the repeated environment environments during Halo's back half were a way of ensuring the game was ready in time for its release date. That could well be the case, but it also makes me wonder whether Two Betrayals backtracking was planned earlier on in development rather than being a necessity in order to get the game out the door. If that is what happened, then the circular rooms and bridges begin to make much more sense. They absolutely are still a chore to get through, but if Bungie had designed Assault on the Control Room with the express idea that you'd also tackle it later backwards, then these sort of environments are perfect in a way due to their symmetry, which means whichever direction you enter them from, they still work as combat arenas. It doesn't necessarily make them any more enjoyable, but thinking of it that way, I can at least sort of see the logic behind them. The other thing worth noting during this part of the level is that there's a nice ramping up of the Flood's presence over time to help give the impression of them quickly sweeping through vast areas of the ring. You first encounter a few of them alongside a larger group of Covenant, followed by both factions duking it out on parallel bridges. The next area is home to more Flood than Covenant. I feel particularly sorry for these elites who get sandwiched between them and Master Chief, after which point you encounter only Flood for the final bridge and circular rooms. It quickly becomes clear that they're beginning to overwhelm the Covenant. Arriving back outside, you'll likely be relieved to hear that it's time to head to the next pulse generator, and I reckon much of Two Betrayals from this point onwards is mustard. It's now nighttime on the ring, with little to cut through the gloom except for gunfire and explosions. There's Covenant everywhere, there's Flood everywhere, and there's more vehicles than you can shake a stick at. You're even given the opportunity to indulge in some aerial combat. And after destroying the second generator, it seems as if Cortana's plan to blow up the Autumn has hit a slight stumbling block. I've located the Pillar of Autumn. She put down 1,200 kilometers up spin. Energy readings show her fusion reactors are still powered up. The systems on the Pillar of Autumn have fail-safes even I can't override without authorization from the captain. We'll need to find him, or his neural implants, to start the fusion core detonation. But before you can begin your search for keys, there's still one more generator left to lay waste to, and to get there, you have to fly through this tunnel. I really don't like this tunnel. Flood-wielding rocket launchers are something of a bugbear for a lot of Halo fans, myself included, and because I doggedly refused to get out my Banshee when entering it, I was killed quite a few times. Why they have to be so bloody accurate, I don't know, and this probably isn't the example most will think of first, but during my most recent playthrough, this was the one occasion where they really had my number. They are way too accurate, there's way too many of them in two betrayals, some placed at ridiculously close quarters, and honestly, I wish they'd go away. You'll next have to cross a bridge filled partially with, you guessed it, some more rocket flood, and given that I'm moaning about the weaponry certain enemies are equipped with, I do also have to give Bungie some credit. They leave tons of guns all over the place for you to pick up, and there's always human and covenant weapons lying around after encounters due to the multi-faction nature of the mission. If the flood's explosive capabilities can at times be a bit much, then at least you're given ample opportunity to tailor your own loadout and have some fun during the only level in Halo's campaign, which features every weapon in the game. 
So much firepower being on offer is pretty handy too, as the next few encounters, including the one I highlighted towards the start of this video, remain some of my favourites to this day. I remember vividly being blown away by the battle unfolding in front of me, as Banshees circle overhead while Covenant and Flood duke it out at ground level. The earlier multi-faction encounter which began the hunt for the second generator, and these which come later, are some of my favourites in the entire game. The Covenant Flood bridge sequences and indoor sections in two betrayals aren't too bad either, and there are some decent similar encounters in the missions which follow, but these outdoor brawls have always been, for me, one of Halo's real highlights. There is still some iffy design here and there. During the first encounter, for example, the flood hidden away to the side of you who usually arrive late to mess up your day are a bit of a cheeky addition by Bungie, but from the moment I step outside for the last time right through to reaching the third generator, I'm always enthralled. Everything feels moody and climactic, and you're involved in combat at a scale unlike anything prior, witnessing the onslaught of an enemy which suddenly seems like much more of a threat than even the Covenant. Back in 2001, I'd seen nothing like it on console or PC. It was a very special experience. My tail has also been tucked firmly between my legs when writing much of this script, as I think I may have made a mistake. In my video ranking Halo Combat Evolves missions, click the card on screen now to check it out, I put two betrayals in 8th place and Assault on the Control Room in 3rd. While I still think Assault on the Control Room is a great level, I actually enjoyed replaying two betrayals just as much, if not more. While it does suffer from a lot of the same issues, the biggest being repetition and length, I found myself far less disinterested playing through two betrayals two or three times than I did at certain points doing the same with Assault on the Control Room. I think the very variation in encounters and the multi-faction elements are enough that I was never as bored as I was when playing through its daytime sibling, which often nearly put me to sleep. Battered and bruised after an extended period of combat, you'll finally reach the last generator, where you'll have to take down one final herd of sentinels, after which two betrayals concludes as you begin the hunt for keys. I learned how to tap into the grid when I was in the control center. Unfortunately, each jump requires a rather consequential expenditure of energy. Something tells me I'm not gonna like this. But I'm pretty sure I can pull it from your suit without permanently damaging your shields. Needless to say, I think we should only try this once. Do it. Next up is the level keys, named of course after the captain himself. As the mission kicks off, it appears Captain Keys may still be alive. I've got a good luck on Captain Key's CNI transponder signal. He's alive, and the implants are intact. There's some interference from the cruiser's damaged reactor. I'll bring us in as close as I can. And I love this little moment immediately after. Oh, I see. The coordinate data needs to be... Right. Sorry. What Bungie has always done so well is balance Halo's more serious side with the occasional lighter touch, and this scene is a great example of how well they managed to strike that balance even in the series' very first title. Further proof that Keys is still alive, to a degree, is provided almost immediately. Don't be a fool. Leave me. Captain? Captain? I've lost him. And I really like that you can get a sneak peek of what's become of him right at the start of the mission, a detail I actually only noticed when recording the footage for this video, despite having played the level numerous times over the last 20 years or so. As you begin to explore the ship's hallways, it immediately becomes clear that the Covenant are having a tough time containing the Flood, and soon after you'll be forced to jump into the pools of coolant below the ship in order to progress. If you elect not to do so, you'll be assaulted by a seemingly endless stream of Flood, and this is a very early indicator of one of Keyes' biggest issues issues, which I'll come back to again very shortly. If you choose not to jump straight away, Cortana will provide a little encouragement. That jump into the coolant is looking better all the time, Chief. And sooner or later, it will become clear that jumping really is the only option. Landing in the dark, rocky area below, your surroundings may feel somewhat familiar. What always jumps out at me when I play Keys is the symmetry between this mission and Truth and Reconciliation towards the start of Halo's campaign. Repetition is without doubt a problem during Halo's second half. Two Betrayals, for example, is a somewhat lazy retread of Assault on the Control Room but in reverse, but when it comes to Keys, I actually rather like the idea behind it. In Truth and Reconciliation, you spend 
spend most of its first half fighting in a dark, rocky environment, before boarding the ship itself with the hope of rescuing the captain, and in Keys you again spend the first half of the mission fighting through a dark, rocky environment, before boarding the ship itself with the hope of rescuing the captain. An early mission in the campaign, Truth and Reconciliation ends rather triumphantly as you manage to free him and escape the ship, whereas Keys, well, I'm not going to spoil anything too much at this point in the video, but suffice to say, it's not a particularly happy ending. The similarity between how both missions play out, combined with very contrasting endings in terms of tone, does a fantastic job of helping continue to drive home what a bleak situation you're actually in by this point in the game. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, and I completely understand where any criticism comes from, but as mentioned, this is the one place where I think it actually works. I've personally always thought the Flood to be a fairly repetitive enemy during missions in which they appear as the sole antagonist, so the numerous Covenant squads dotted across this area, and indeed the rest of the mission, are a welcome addition. It's a chaotic brawl which never lets up, but unfortunately Key's level design somewhat sours the experience as a whole. Bungie's level design has always been brilliant in that most missions are set up to feature a mix of both narrow and open encounters. The mission's counterpart, True From Reconciliation for example, begins in larger, open spaces, before you board the ship and environments become far more narrow. In my view, it is a crucial part of making each and every game in the series flow as well as it does, but unfortunately, Keys is one of those rare occasions where this design philosophy seems to take a bit of a back seat. This outdoor area is more open than the ship, but not greatly so, and that means by the time you're back on the truth and reconciliation and have fought through a few more encounters, everything begins to feel very repetitive. Fighting through the ship should feel like the exciting final stretch in your search for the captain, but because you're not actually doing anything Thing particularly different from the rest of the mission, it ends up falling quite flat. I do also have a second issue as well, which is more a question of personal preference, but I also think this area could have been a little brighter. The flood tend to come from every direction, which can be difficult enough to handle, and combined with the lack of light, which often makes it difficult to see them before they're right on top of you, I find this section not to be claustrophobic, but instead frustrating. Oh, and who can forget about the endless wave of flood which spawn in the exact same place time and time again before slowly walking towards a pair of hunters. As previously mentioned, the seemingly infinite amount of flood encountered during this mission are a real problem, and their inclusion is made particularly obvious here if you just stand back and wait. It's a poor addition that really highlights the issue and didn't need to be there at all. After fighting your way to the grav lift, you once again board the ship. The first thing you'll likely notice is the piles of Covenant bodies, some of which look like they've been dragged purposely to where they now lie, and as you continue to explore, you'll find more in nearby hallways as well. Cortana even makes note of it. Look in the corners. The Flood are gathering bodies. I know I've been something of a negative Nelly so far, but this is a genuinely unsettling piece of environmental storytelling I wish Bungie had done a lot more of during this mission. At this moment in time, you won't exactly understand why the bodies are being gathered, but it will make a lot more sense once you progress a little further and eventually realise what the Flood have been up to. Unfortunately, however, this glimmer of hope that Keys may be about to really ramp things up in terms of quality is followed by what is quite possibly one of the worst sections in any Halo title. The purple halls of the Truth and Reconciliation are repetitive enough, but Bungie continues to throw more and more Covenant and Flood into the mix, and the whole thing becomes an enormous slog to get through. Say what you want about the library, and I personally have complained about the library in the past, but it at least gave you room to manoeuvre. But here, the Flood never seemed to stop coming, and there are far, far too many any carrier forms, a ridiculous number in fact. When they explode, they essentially act as grenades, and of course there are also plenty of grenades on the ground waiting to explode too, and what you end up with is a series of encounters which are uncharacteristically random compared to most featured in the game. Halo is on the whole usually pretty fair in that any deaths will usually be your own fault. There are the occasional moments which are definitely unfair, those involving flood with rocket launchers spring to mind, but on the whole it does a good job of avoiding player frustration despite its sandbox nature. During this part of Keys, however, things often them feel very unfair. It's incredibly easy to be caught off guard by a carrier form, a chain of grenade explosions, or a crowd of flood big enough that there's too many to fight off. Of course, the argument could be made that this is Halo's penultimate level and it should be difficult, but in general, I think the second half of Keys especially does a bad job of towing the line between being a challenge and being needlessly difficult and a little unfair. There is at least some good dialogue during this section as you hear from Keys a couple more times, once in this hangar. He's delirious. In pain, we have to find him. And again, just moments before you locate him. The captain, his vitals are fading. Please, chief, hurry. 
What you come across when you do finally find Keyes is horrific to say the least. You're just a bit too late to have any chance of saving him and he is now part of a proto-grave mind. No human life signs detected. The captain, he's one of them. And although I've been critical of the anniversary edition on numerous occasions, the terminal you find in the same room depicting the captain's struggle against the flood is absolutely brilliant. Keys. Take out the captain. Service number 01928-19912. JK. You will not have me. These scenes are perhaps the most shocking in the entire game, and it demonstrates that any character, no matter their importance, can be killed off at any time. It's a fantastic climactic moment, which makes the fact the rest of the level is so mediocre very disappointing indeed. After Master Chief has secured the Captain's neural implant, Keys unfortunately very quickly lurches from the sublime to the ridiculous. Lots more Flood arrive on the scene as well as the Covenant Strike Force sent in to clear them up. And if you thought the carrier forms and grenades were bad enough before, you now also have to deal with Grunts carrying fuel rod cannons as well. Fuel rod cannons which also explode once the Grunt carrying them has been dispatched. A rather obnoxious feature given the issues the mission already suffers from. Once you fight through the Flood and Covenant surrounding the room the Captain is in, the mission does thankfully let up a little all, and the final few encounters are a bit more forgiving than those leading up to the big reveal. And after a few more battles, you'll come across a number of banshees, and after commandeering one, Keys draws to a close. I mentioned the Anniversary Edition's brilliant terminal a little earlier, and I do have a bit more praise to give it. I'm generally not a fan of what it does with the game's graphics, and there are numerous examples of it actually changing the tone in certain parts of the game, but one area where I do think they work really well is during the outdoor section near the start of Keys. They're still generally somewhat overdesigned but it's not as bad as the Covenant ship later on in the mission, which I don't like much at all, and the increased visibility afforded to you is no bad thing in my books. The model used for the Proto-Grave Mind is also suitably disgusting, with human faces covering its mass, but I think the overall change of colour and the busyness of its design means on balance I still prefer the original version. The thing I find disappointing about Keys is that it could have been so much more. In story terms, it's a very dark affair, and while some may criticise how similar it is to Truth and Reconciliation, in my view, that actually works in its favour. Is it the worst mission in Halo Combat Evolved? Probably not, but I can't help but think that if Bungie had a little more time to focus on the mission, it could have been so much more. Speaking of the word more, we've at long last reached Halo Combat Evolve's final level. The more begins with some shots of the now defunct Pillar of Autumn sitting atop a cliff as the fantastic track which shares its name with the level swells in the background. Some of the textures may look a tad janky in the present, but back in the day this was one of my favourite scenes in the game. At the start of Halo, the ship was drifting proudly through space. At its end, it cuts a rather forlorn figure. It really helps bring the campaign full circle. Arriving using the Banshee stolen at the end of the previous level, Master Chief barely manages to make it aboard the Autumn. This thing is falling apart! It'll hold. We're not gonna make it! We'll make it. Pull up! Pull up! You did that on purpose, didn't you? And Cortana fills you in on your objective. We need to get to the bridge. From there, we can use the captain's neural implants to initiate an overload of the ship's fusion engines. The explosion should damage enough systems below it to destroy the ring. While the moor may share its location with Halo's first mission, the Pillar of Autumn you find yourself in is one very different to that featured at the beginning of the game. During that mission, the ship was a bustling place. Granted, most of the humans you encountered were quite busy fending off the Covenant, but it felt like somewhere full of life regardless. In the present, that is certainly not the case. While there are Covenant strike teams aboard the ship, in terms of both environment and enemies, you can almost taste the stench of death in the air. The Autumn itself is dilapidated, and its halls are crawling with flood, with a far smaller contingency of Covenant and Sentinels on hand, doing their best to stop both you and the parasitic horrors which lurk around every corner. You'll recognise a lot of the ship from your earlier visit, such as the area housing the evacuation pods, the dining room and the vents now pitch black, and the environment in its totality oozes atmosphere. 
During Halo Combat Evolve's latter stages, a lot of what you do mirrors to some extent at least the game's first half. In Truth and Reconciliation, you battle through a rocky environment and then a Covenant ship to rescue Keys. And in Keys, you again begin in a dark mountainous area and then fight your way through a Covenant ship to rescue the captain. Except where in the first example you are successful, the second time around doesn't end anywhere near as well. Two Betrayals follows a similar pattern. Its objectives don't line up as beautifully as my first example, but nonetheless everything will still seem very familiar. During Assault on the Control Room, you blast your way towards Installation 04's surprise surprise control room, whereas in two betrayals you head in the opposite direction starting from the control room, all the while witnessing the continued spread of the flood. Your first visit to the area focused on the conflict between humans and the Covenant, while your second made it clear that the game has completely changed. The Covenant suddenly don't seem like anywhere near as much of a threat compared to the flood. While the horrifying discovery at the end of Keys and the battles across the darkened tundra in Two Betrayals are for me some of the best moments in Halo, the early stages of the Moor have a special place in my heart. There are so many Flood in such tight spaces that they threaten at times to overwhelm, and it often feels like you're playing a more modern take on Doom as you blast your way down the autumn's winding corridors. Two Betrayals, while entertaining, perhaps went on a little longer than it should have, and indoor sections in Keys felt unfair at times, with gunfire hitting you from every angle and explosions going off all over the place. In comparison, I think the Moor strikes a good balance in terms of both chaos and length. You get 10 to 15 minutes of multi-faction madness, which I think is about enough, and you mostly fight enemies who appear directly ahead of you, other than this really entertaining encounter featuring Hunters and Flood on either side of you, which I love. Events never feel like they're being dragged out, and combat remains engaging, something that cannot be said for every level in Halo's second half. The game's latter stages are full of chaotic encounters, sometimes too many compared to the more considered combat against the Covenant towards its start, and I'm glad Bungie concluded things with something ever so slightly more measured. The claustrophobic indoor combat is also broken up by a short scene, during which you discover that Guilty Spark has stopped the ship's self-destruct sequence and is hunkered down in the engine room, which is where you'll need to head next if your plan is to succeed. How much firepower would you need to crack one of the engine shields? Not much. A well-placed grenade, perhaps, but why... Okay, I'm coming with you. Soon enough, you'll arrive at that very same engine room, and I've never been convinced that this next sequence is an altogether good one. Essentially, there are four exhaust manifolds which you need to retract so you can launch explosives at the Autumn's Fusion Drive Core in order to trigger a detonation, and you need to work your way through them one by one. I know that doesn't sound so bad in principle, but it can be rather annoying. First, jumping to get where you need to go while being lasered by sentinels and shot at by flood is not overly enjoyable. It's easy to get distracted by your enemies and misstep, and because the area is comprised of three levels, with your objectives on the top floor, any small mistake will often be punished by either a swift death at the hands of enemies waiting below, or at the very least, a jog back upstairs. There is, I suppose, an argument to be made that this is the final proper encounter of the game, and therefore should be the ultimate test of your ability to manage both movement and combat during a heated skirmish, but personally, I reckon there was probably a better way of doing that. Second, using grenades to get the job done can be quite tricky, as you'll see from this awful footage I recorded when I tried to do it. As an aside, I remember being able to do it with ease way back when, now not so much. You can, however, head to a nearby-ish armory to stock up on rockets and anything else you need to make life a bit easier, but this means you need to leave the area and go on a not insignificant crawl to find them. Bungie clearly knew that some players might need the assist, especially given the difficulty some less gifted gamers, like myself, might have using grenades to get the job done, so I'm not sure why the extra armaments weren't just placed somewhere within the engine room rather than miles away. As it stands, if you do need some additional firepower, you're forced to Treat and then head back, and it's all rather unnecessary. I know some are going to say, yeah, but why would rockets be kept in an engine room instead of the armory? What a ridiculous suggestion. And they'd be correct, but you're also fighting space zombies on a world shaped like a ring. Sometimes I think it's okay to go a touch off piste in the name of gameplay and pacing. Whether using grenades or rockets, soon enough it will be time to escape, after taking down a final group of Covenants, that is. And thus, we come to what is far and away the best part of the moor. Things are getting noisy down there. Everything okay? Negative, negative. We have a 
Wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. You have six minutes, or five on Legendary, to escape the Pillar of Autumn, but before I talk about the Warthog run itself, it must be acknowledged that this section doesn't really make a ton of sense. I'm pretty sure the ship itself isn't as long as the area you drive through, and in terms of geometry, it doesn't seem to serve that function or a purpose, with this teeny tiny bridge which seemingly connects the two halves of the Autumn being particularly odd. In fact, I'm pretty confident I even remember some of Bungie's team who worked on Halo Combat Evolved stating similar, even with that being the case, I think we can let it slide given how completely and utterly entertaining it is. In design terms, it does feel somewhat like Bungie are deliberately attempting to sabotage your escape with the way the racetrack of sorts is laid out. Sometimes you'll have to make sharp turns to avoid grinding to a halt, and in general it can be quite tricky to navigate. I like that though, you won't see much of it in this footage, granted, but it is possible to zoom your way through most of it without needing to stop much at all once you get the hang of things, and that makes repeat playthroughs a lot more rewarding than, say, taking on the similar sequence included in Halo 3's final level, Halo. There, spaces tend to be much larger, and the brief indoor sections you go through are far easier to traverse. I'd probably give the edge to it over the Moore's Warthog run when looking at it from the perspective of someone playing the games for the first time. Speed is encouraged and you don't feel like you're constantly being tripped up, but replayability-wise, the Moore is king. There's also a short break in proceedings on the weird bridge I mentioned earlier, as Fohammer's fate is revealed. Cortana to Echo 419. Two Covenant Banshees are approaching on your six. Evade. Say again, evade. I Echo 419! She's gone. Calculating alternate escape route. Ship's inventory shows one longsword fighter is still docked in Launch Bay 7. If we move now, we can make it. I've always been a big fan of the character, and I do wish she'd remained in the series a while longer. While we do have Johnson present throughout the trilogy to provide marine representation, I did like there also being another supporting character interacting with Master Chief and Cortana, who was just one of the marines. With little time remaining, the race is on to reach a longsword fighter docked nearby which can be used to flee the doomed ring, something this poor little fella probably didn't manage to do. Good thing that food nipple's waiting for me at the starship, cause man, oh, if I worked up a big, crunchy thirst! Although I'm sure he's happy enough enjoying the great food nipple in the sky. And of course, with there being a timer, it is also possible for the same to happen to you, which rewards you, so to speak, with this scene. The incredible final sequence ends with the classic sprint to a craft of some description before making a last minute escape trope so prevalent in games, films and TV, and while it is a little cheesy, it fits the section well as a whole. It is, to be fair, action movie cinema in video game form. Halo's theme kicks in, there are explosions from every direction, and you don't have to think too much about any obstacles due to the simplification in level design compared to the first half of the section. It's blooming awesome. Boarding the longsword and returning to the nothingness of space, you get a brief ending scene. Did anyone else make it? Scanning. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. We did what we had to do for Earth. An entire Covenant Armada obliterated and the Flood. We had no choice. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Before Halo Combat Evolved comes to an end. During the ending, there is also an additional scene that you'll only see if you're playing on Legendary difficulty, and it is the best Halo cutscene ever. Come here, you mother Oh, This is it, baby. Hold me. And with that particularly sexy cinematic, we reach the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, boys, girls and Spartans. If you enjoyed it, do consider liking, subscribing and sharing your thoughts, and hopefully we'll meet again soon.